Yeah. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. It's great to have all of you here, and uh, we are so excited to have this inaugural lecture for the Texas Tech University Humanities Center, and uh, to have it uh, started by such a distinguished guest as uh, the director of the National Humanities Center. Uh, we're so pleased to have uh, Jeffrey uh, Harpum here and uh, look forward to his comments uh, and uh, his perspectives. Uh, but I really appreciate you all being here. This is a historic uh, moment, I think, in Texas Tech University history to, to have this inaugural uh, Humanities Center lecture, but also in some ways to celebrate the start of the Humanities uh, Center. We're proud I'm proud as president to be one of the supporters of this initiative and uh, proud to celebrate the humanities at this institution. You know, to me, the humanities are one of the important elements, one of the important foundation elements of any great university. And one of the things that we want, we want to build here uh, is uh, a, a great uh, a university. And we're working on that. We have many elements of that already, but certainly having strong uh, support in the humanities is an important part of that and, and uh, we celebrate that every day with the strength that we already have here but we want to take it clearly to another level of success and we're joined here by uh, other supporters of the Humanities Center, our, our Provost and Senior Vice President Lawrence Skubanek, Dr. Skubanek and also our and also our Senior Vice President for Research, uh, Robert Duncan. You know, we jokingly refer to him. Now that we have two Robert Duncans, we have to distinguish. And so uh, he gets often referred to as R2D2. Uh, <laughs> because uh, just as a way, he gets a lot of the email from the chancellor and kind of helps uh, work through that with the chancellor. So appreciate that. But you can see uh, the influence of the humanity disciplines throughout history and from the earliest universities, but throughout the beginning of time. Um, the formation of countries, the governments, um, the education of our leaders and children, all permeated through by the humanities. And exploring and researching the important areas found within the humanities is really essential, I think, to the foundation of this university, this region, our state, and our country. And I applaud the efforts of those who work to make this possible. And many in the room have been an important part of that but a key person in really leading uh, that effort is the, the first, the inaugural director of the Humanities Center, who I'd like to introduce at this stage, uh, uh, Dorothy Chansky. And so, Professor Chansky, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you all for being here as we celebrate this historic occasion with this inaugural lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs> much President Nelson. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we have a humanities center on this campus because of the far-sightedness of President Nellis uh, and Provost Lawrence Skubanek and we have today's event because of the generosity of um, Vice President for Research Rob Duncan. Thank you. Um, Early on, uh, I said that our center aims to be Janus face, that is facing outward and facing inward. We look outward to find new galvanizing and significant humanities research and work. And we seek within our own campus to support scholars producing new galvanizing and significant work. Um, you can read a little bit more about the Humanities Center in the program and included in the program uh, is a list of all the people who served on the steering committee and the people who are currently members of the board. And I just want to do a shout out to both the steering committee and the board. There's a lot of overlap there because uh, this is a working board and they're working. Um, so I now want to uh, introduce today's speaker, which I'm going to do briefly. I tend to read um, all programs the way I read theater programs, which is to say that the details don't make all that much sense to me until after I've seen the performance, and then I want to know everything I can know. <laughs> um, and I uh, have no reason to think that um, Jeffrey Bell Harper's performance is going to be anything other than star quality. So rather than introducing him via his CV, I just want to read the titles of some of his books because they speak to the kind of deeply curious, wise, synoptic thinking 
person that he is. Um, like Garrison Keillor and like me, he started out as an English major and you know went on from there. Um, although rumors that he's going to have his own Saturday night radio show may or may not be true. So um, his titles include On the Grotesque, Strategies of Contradiction in Art and Literature, The Ascetic Imperative in Culture and Criticism, Getting It Right, Language, Literature, and Ethics, One of Us, The Mastery of Joseph Conrad, Shadows of Ethics, Criticism and the Just Society, Language Alone, The Critical Fetish of Modernity, a glossary of literary terms co-authored with Myra H. Abrams, The Character of Criticism, On Being Human, a special issue of Daedalus, and uh, his most recent book, which a number of us on the board have read, and which is the book that convinced me that he was the man to give our inaugural talk, mm -hmm. The Humanities and the Dream of America. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bell Harper. Mm -hmm. Take it away. Well, I want not only to thank Dorothy for her kind invitation, but also to congratulate her on a magnificent event for her and for the entire uh, Texas Tech campus. I've never been to Lubbock before, uh, but I have a couple of friends on the faculty, Anna Christina Ribeira. Has Jonathan Dorothy accompanied you, Anna? There, where's Jonathan? There you are, right. And Chris Whitmore, who was a fellow at my center last or this year, as Anna was uh, uh, a fellow last year. Um, it's beautiful weather that you have here. I grew up in Chicago, which I had thought flat before I came here, but which now <laughs> looks in retrospect something like the Swiss Alps. Uh, and uh, I'm especially pleased and grateful to have been asked to address this occasion because the uh, the cause of the, uh, the, the, the joint purposiveness of the humanities and the sciences is one that I've become very, very close to. I run a national humanities center, so it would seem that all my attention and interest is focused on the humanities, and that's true. But one effect of that has been to awaken me to the possibilities for interconnection with other disciplines, law, public policy, cognitive science, uh, evolutionary biology, even computer science, primatology. I've invited all and people representing all those disciplines to come and talk at the National Humanities Center. And the result has been a general enrichment of the total environment. And I really believe that uh, uh, a, uh, a, a world-class campus demands and deserves a robust presence in the humanities, no matter how technological or no matter how non-humanistic the, the basic mission of the university might appear to be. I think that everybody is improved and everybody is enriched. And that's the argument that I'm going to be making today. Let's see, there we go. Perhaps because Steve Jobs died at a moment when the subject of jobs was very gloomily on the American mind. He died in 2011 and the unemployment rate was approaching 10% at that point. His death was the occasion of a lot of weighty rumination with each deep thinker stepping forward to claim him on behalf of their favorite theory or preoccupation. And so Mr. Jobs was depicted as a perfect example of American technical know-how, individualism, valor and courage in the face of adversity, managerial br brilliance, the psychological consequences of abandonment, high-performing autism, I'm not making this up, this is <laughs> poor, poor parenting and genius as such. And this last theory was developed by Walter Isaacson whose biography of Jobs appeared with uncanny timing just a few days after his subject's demise. In an article in the New York Times, Isaacson argued that Jobs was not a genius of the intellect, but a genius of ingenuity, the capacity to combine technical skill with aesthetic sensibility. And here, Isaacson concluded, was the takeaway from Jobs' life. China and India are likely to produce many rigorous analytical thinkers and knowledgeable technologists. But smart, educated people don't always spawn innovation. America's advantage, if it continues to have one, will be to the, that it can produce people who are also creative and imaginative, those who know how to stand at the intersection of science and the humanities. Now, I thought this was kind of a curious inference to draw from the life of somebody who was so unimpressed by a liberal education that he dropped out of Reed after one semester. In fact, I think it's, it, it might be Isaacson himself who is more representative of American thinking than his idiosyncratic subject. Because Isaacson clearly wants to believe that the secret of social success is education, an education of a particular non-specialist kind. 
in which the sciences are married or remarried to the humanities. Many in the United States feel that academic disciplines themselves run counter to the native genius of the people, which is pragmatic, improvisational, and inclusive, rather than orderly, programmed, and constrained. This is a character characteristically American position. While others are often concerned to articulate and understand the differences between the two cultures, as C.P. Snow put it, represented by science and the humanities, Americans are much more likely to denounce the very existence of distinct disciplinary cultures as unnecessary, and counterproductive, and impediment to genuine thinking and research. The anti-disciplinary argument, I'm going to argue, takes two forms. The first, commonly referred to as the unity of knowledge, or consilience, is associated with the Harvard biologist E. O. Wilson, who believes that the only project here we go, worth pursuing is the quest for the fundamental laws of nature, and that progress in this quest will only be made if science, and biology in particular, is given leadership responsibilities with other disciplines making helpful contributions on an as-needed basis. In some of the more ecstatic formulations of consilience, uh, it's argued that it's not just sound policy, but a way of reclaiming a, a, a long-lost primordial unity of knowledge. Notice that uh, Wilson is a very peaceable looking man. I actually, he was one of the people that I invited to the center uh, not long after I arrived and I was having dinner with him afterwards and uh, I said, you know, many people regard you as kind of a, a, the kind and loving face of biological reductionism which would destroy religion and everything. And he said, I have answered the altar call and gone under the waters. <laughs> <laughs> there was no problem at all for him. <laughs> Another kind of challenge to disciplinar disciplinarity is mounted in the name of interdisciplinarity, not the unity of knowledge, but the collection of different kinds of knowledge. For many years, perhaps since the invention of disciplines themselves, it's been widely accepted that complex problems such as land use or global warming, the epidemiology of AIDS, or the causes of the French Revolution are best addressed by gathering and blending and combining a number of different approaches rather than confining oneself arbitrarily to a single approach. In the American Academy in particular, interdisciplinarity too has a kind of prelapsarian aspect. It's widely seen as a way to slough off the aging bark of institutional senescence and regain epistemological innocence by occupying the fluid, dynamic, dy uh, liminal uh, spaces between established disciplines. And here's a curious thing. Calls for the unification of knowledge primarily come from scientists. But the chorus of advocates for inter interdisciplinarity is made up primarily of administrators, who often touted as the best response to contemporary conditions. Thus, university president, University of Michigan president, emeritus James Duderstadt writes, in our increasingly complex, interdependent world, narrow answers will not succeed. The interdisciplinary moment is not a fad, but a fundamental and long-term restructuring of the nature of scholarly activity the guiding principle of a new and vibrant intellectual community, human connections between the isolated bulwarks of different departments. Bulwarks, <laughs> a term to be added to other administrative synonyms for disciplines, including tombs, caves, and silos. Makes you wonder if they give you a, a thesaurus when you become an administrator. <laughs> now, nobody wants to be trapped in one of these airless spaces, but it's clear that with its programs and joint appointments, Interdisciplinarity is not just a way of dealing with complexity, but it's also a way for deans and provosts to wrest control away from large, powerful, self-interested departments. Now, let's see, I was told that I could, there we go. Now, my argument in what follows is going to run counter to both of these calls for anything but disciplines. I think that disciplines should be preserved and valued, not despite their limitations, but because of them. If disciplines were to be abolished or blended or otherwise weakened, I'm going to argue that we would all be poorer. Indeed, everything would be terribly confused and there would be irreplaceable losses. I'm not suggesting that the lines between disciplines should be fiercely policed to defend against encroachments or contaminations. I'm arguing that the very existence of disciplinary boundaries has not only secured the autonomy of disciplines, enabling extraordinary advances and preserving research from external agendas, but in the manner of fences generally, has actually provoked the very efforts to cross over them, efforts that have produced some of the most exciting and productive episodes in intellectual history. As well, one has to admit, some of the most trivial and self-important. Science and the humanities are like two very large and diverse countries separated by a wide river, something that perhaps uh, Texans can understand. 
Crossing that river can be profitable and interesting, but only if the crossings are occasional and considered to be risky. Too frequent or too easy crossings can produce in the constant tourist a slackened sense of general unbelonging and unimportance. Advocates for consilience or interdisciplinarity often presumes that the disciplines can be abolished or blended easily because the only obstacles to doing this are ideological or political. Advocates for preserving the disciplines make their own kind of mistake symmetrical by imagining that disciplines have an intrinsic purity that cannot be corrupted. I think that the situation is in fact much more complicated and so I'd like to take a couple of minutes to sketch out some of the complications before moving on to actual cases. Stephen Jay Gould once described science and the humanities as two distinct ways of knowing the world, two non-overlapping magisteria, as he put it. One of them empirical and hard, and the other subjective and soft. But there are lots of ways that these magisteria do, in fact, overlap. There are soft sciences, for example. We call them social sciences. And within the even softer disciplines, like mine of English, there are recurrent drives, mostly theory-based, to recast the humanities as science humaine, with a quantitative or empirical dimension. And on the other side, within the hard sciences, we find numerous concessions to, for example, the explanatory power of metaphor, or to the aesthetic qualities of elegance, beauty, or simplicity in testing the adequacy of an hypothesis. So in fact, there are widely acknowledged and well-established principles of cross-fertilization, of overlappingness. Still, it's useful to begin with a basic distinction between disciplines that, like natural sciences assisted by mathematics, seek to produce reliable knowledge about things that actually exist, and those disciplines that focus on what things mean or how they should be valued. For the purpose of this argument, I'm going to set aside the social sciences, which can go both ways. This basic, rough, even reductive distinction between goals is also a distinction between the kinds of objects that are studied. Natural science is not typically interested in man-made things, but only in things that appear in the world without human agency. Life forms, atoms, molecules, genes, photons, the little strings that make up the universe, organisms, crystals, planets, viruses. Science begins and ends in the present tense. Even when it tries to understand the origin or evolution of an organism or a species, it begins with the actually existing object and, as it were, reverse engineers it in order to understand how this object came to be. And science is staked on the premise that the world is knowable, that truth can be separated from falsehood, and that knowledge is not to be confused with opinion or belief. Also, science is almost entirely concerned with creating new knowledge. There's absolutely no point from a scientific perspective to revisiting arguments or issues settled long ago and taking a renewed satisfaction in their brilliance. The objects of science may exist in the present tense, but the focus of the field is entirely on progress towards the future on the increase of knowledge. We try to understand how things came to be so we may, we may predict or direct future developments. Now, for the past half century or more, the focus has been on instrumental or directed research oriented towards specific results, rather than on the basic research that once, not all that long ago, made of science a field of creativity and intellectual joy. In the era of C.P. Snow, who I mentioned earlier, who wrote of the two cultures in the late 1950s, many scientists still took an unembarrassed pride in the inutility of their vocation. But with the emergence over the course of the 1950s of the National Institutes for Health and the National Science Foundation, science in the United States became dependent on government funding, which went overwhelmingly to two primary areas, health and defense. Since the end of the Cold War, funding for defense-related activities has suffered, while a greater share of the shrinking pool of resources has gone to innovation and economic competitiveness, with a particular focus on the development of new technologies, products, processes, and services. Today, the sciences as practiced in the American research institutions are almost entirely instrumental and require no other justification than that they contribute to improved or increased productivity, jobs, health, and especially wealth. Science would seem to be an empirical uh, undertaking based on observation of fact as opposed to the humanistic emphasis on judgment, evaluation, and interpretation. But this is actually, I think, not the case. Empiricism does not represent a bright line between the disciplines, but a bridge. The commitment by science to empiricism is far from total, 
for the very first gesture that science makes when confronted by the evidence of the senses is to translate that evidence into abstractions such as numbers, symbols, graphs, or formulae in order to get at a deeper structure of reality than the senses could possibly give us. The vocabulary of science is ideal and symbolic, and what it tries to produce is not strictly speaking empirical knowledge, but rather a formal representation of non-contingent facts, mind-independent facts. In fact, science is impatient with empiricism, which is painfully slow compared to the boost of acceleration provided by a good theory. This is the argument of James Conant, uh, president of Harvard long ago. The presumably soft humanities actually display a quite substantial but still qualified commitment to empiricism. The humanities are concerned with man-made objects, taking a special interest in those that have some expressive value such as documents or works of art. They study these things over and over and over again. One report published in 2009 announced that there had been 16,672 books published on Shakespeare in the preceding 50 years, a number that was way out of date by the time the, the study was published. The reason for this is not only that scholars have to publish, but that man-made objects require and repay such attention. They serve as mirrors for ourselves as we read our own concerns and questions into them, and they're complicated. Any man-made artifact both expresses and screens the human agency that produced it, and this agency is to a humanist the real object of inquiry. Science studies the thing in itself. The humanities focus on the human processes that led to the appearance or the creation of the thing. So the empirical attention to the material object, no matter how obsessively pursued, is merely a phase in an inquiry of an entirely different kind, devoted to recovering the processes that resulted in that object. It's, an, it's, it's a process of mind attempting to grasp mind through the medium of the thing. Now the end result of humanistic scholarship is not, unlike science, reliable knowledge. Indeed, from a certain perspective, humanistic knowledge barely deserves the name of knowledge because it consists not in facts about actually existing things, but in speculation about the inaccessible processes, psychological, social, material, economic, ideological, institutional, historical, all those processes that produce them, or in assessments of their meaning or their value. The humanities give us truths that, <coughs> the, excuse me, <coughs> the humanities give us not truths that we can trust, but suggestions that we can entertain, a fresh perspective, a new evaluation, a different understanding, an enriched appreciation. In a sense, the humanities give us knowledge we cannot trust and actually invite us not to trust it. Perhaps the deepest difference from an institutional perspective is that science is oriented toward professional practice. While the true locus of the humanities is in the classroom and even in society as a whole, the humanities do have a formidable research assignment. They have total responsibility for everything that anybody knows about anything beyond what happens, say, to them from last night to the present moment. But we look to the humanities for something other than factual information as well. We look for a kind of inner illumination, a sensation of expanded awareness or understanding. The humanities cannot produce the kind of knowledge that the sciences can, nor do they aspire to the predictive power that the social sciences sometimes claim. But they serve another function that's equally as valuable as these. By insisting on the importance and the value and the necessity of subjective acts, such as evaluation, judgment, and above all interpretation, they represent the liberation of the mind from its subservience to fact. No matter how closely humanists are attending to the document or the artifact they're studying, what they're really trying to do is make an argument. They're trying, in other words, to withdraw the sword of thought from the stone of necessity. If science is where the mind locks onto fact, the humanities are where the, cur the world as currently understood is opened up, subjected to speculation, inference, guesswork. They are where the mind is both disciplined to the task of precision and invited to luxuriate in possibility. Now, of course, both the scientific and the humanistic ways of knowing the world or magisteria are necessary. Without the scientific perspective, we'd be lost in a world of speculation, drifting ever farther from anchorage, living in a world of timelessness and subjectivity. 
And without the humanities, we'd be equally lost in a world of quantifiable but meaningless entities, a world of fact with no values, no significance attached, no way of judging the importance of what we were seeing. Thank God there are no wholly scientific or humanistic brains. Although some may come close, the extremes are more likely to be considered under the category of pathology or deformation than exceptional purity. And so to repeat, my argument does not concern the necessity of preserving the distinctness of these categories, but rather of preserving enough separation so that the experience of crossing the Rio Grande that divides them will be considered risky and rare and adventuresome. Routine is the enemy of genuine creativity, and any really interesting innovation benefits from having to overcome disincentives, obstacles, and the disapprobation of the majority. Okay. I'd like now to talk about three of the riskier, non-routine, and productive experiments and discipline blend blending in the humanities and sciences. Two of them involve humanists appropriating scientific methods one involves science taking on humanistic issues. The first one is Darwin.